good afternoon dear friends and colleagues it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome all of you today for today's function the vgk memorial lecture and uh, let me uh, begin by welcoming our uh, speaker uh, dr kasturi rangan very fortunate to have him he readily agreed to this invitation and thank you very much sir and warm welcome to you i'm also very happy to welcome uh, members of vijay kulkarni's family who are present with us on this occasion every year it's a kind of uh, family gathering for us a very special day a very warm welcome to you it's wonderful to have you back uh, with us every year i see many former colleagues uh, people associated with the center in various capacities welcome to all of you and my colleagues as well uh, let me begin by uh, saying a few words as we usually do on this occasion about a former director uh, founder director vg kulkarni who was a scientist from tifr it's uh, the day when we remember vgk and the reasons and his motivation for founding a center of this uh, kind which is somewhat unique in the indian landscape and we renew our uh, commitment to the goals that uh, it, of the, our institution so shri <clears throat> uh, vijay kulkarni born 1932 Uh, began his career in 1953 at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai at the peak of his career as a solid state and nuclear physicist he decided to devote himself to the cause of science education in the country under the guidance of professor b m udgaonkar he founded and nurtured the homi baba center for science education and he was its director from 1974 until his retirement in 1994 During his distinguished career as a scientist and educationist, Sri Vijay Kulkarni was connected with several educational institutions and organizations, and was a recipient of many honors and awards, including the Dr. Govardhan Das Parik Award in 1985. With his students and colleagues, he undertook many significant research projects, especially for improvement of science and mathematics education of children from disadvantaged sections of the society. in fact the center began with a major project an intervention with the bombay municipal corporation schools and subsequently with uh, several schools government schools located in rural areas of maharashtra uh, the ashram schools in maharashtra and so on so i'll say a little bit about this uh, later uh, <clears throat> the place of language in education was a major focal point of his research in science education he wrote extensively simply and convincingly in marathi and english on science and the need for a scientific culture in society a lover of books he was a brilliant orator uh, known for his scholarship mastery of words and a refreshing sense of humor shri vijay kulkarni expired on july 13 2002 as a tribute to him hpcsc has instituted a series of annual memorial lectures which began in 2002 so today is the 17th lecture <clears throat> these lectures given by eminent scientists and educationists deal with central issues in science technology education and society uh, i'll say a little bit more about our founder especially something about his values and commitments uh, firstly he was a person committed to science in in a true sense science as a free creative enterprise in, of enquiry uh, which keeps a broad and open mind free from biases and which meant that science education was at the very center of that vision of science and that was his commitment to take science to the masses and to begin a program with uh, the underprivileged sections in bombay city and to found this center another commitment of vijay kulkarni's that we recall today is his commitment to the nation and to nation building as uh, shri varun sani who spoke from this podium a few days ago reminded us the true meaning of nation 
is not something abstract, something in stone or in metaphors and so on, but it's the people. So the nation is nothing but the people of India. And it was to that idea of nation and to that vision of nation building that Vijay Kolkani was committed. So he wanted the people of India, those who make up its nation, to advance, to come, to make progress. And again, he saw education as the means to that, and science education. Finally, I must just mention that Sri Vijay Kulkarni had a very broad sensibility. He was hospitable to many streams and perspectives of uh, thought. He collaborated with uh, social scientists. In fact, the Tata Institute of Social Science nearby was an active uh, institution for collaboration. And those links continue even today. So this broad Catholicity, we also try to reflect in the programs at the center. We take some pride in saying that we are a place where there's interdisciplinary work and uh, perspectives from both science and social science, which are necessary for education, are brought together in our work. So today we renew our commitment to those goals and to those uh, uh, values and those priorities. <clears throat> I would like uh, all of us to participate in uh, honoring uh, Vijay memory and also by honoring uh, Mrs. Vijay Kulkarni, who is present here today. I request Professor Sandeep Trivedi to uh, give her a uh, flower bouquet. Thank you, Professor Trivedi. Thank you, ma'am. Very happy to have all of them, uh, Mrs. Uh, Kulkarni, Sri Vijay Kulkarni's daughter, uh, son-in-law, Sri Vijay Kulkarni's both sons, daughter-in-law, all of them are present today. Wonderful to have you with us, and uh, hope this association continues year after year. <coughs> I'll say a little bit about our speaker today, uh, Dr. Kasuri Rangan, who needs no introduction, is an eminent space scientist, headed the space program for many years, and has many other accomplishments to his credit. Uh, we're very happy to have you in our midst today, sir. Uh, and you know, uh, some of you, that he's very closely associated with the central goal of the institution, namely education. He is now heading a committee which is formulating a vision and a policy for education uh, for the country in the years to come. <clears throat> the 70th VG Kulkarni Memorial Lecture will be delivered by eminent space scientist, Dr. K. Kasturi Rangan. Dr. Kasturi Rangan is currently the chair of the Committee for National Education Policy. He's also Chancellor, Central University of Rajasthan, and Chair, Public Affairs Center, Bangalore. He is chair of the Karnataka Knowledge Commission and a member of the Atomic Energy Commission. He is emeritus professor at the National Institute of Advanced Studies, NIAS, in Bangalore, and an honorary distinguished scientific advisor of the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO. <clears throat> Earlier, as chairman of ISRO, he oversaw the space program of India between the years 94, 1994 and 2003. He was a member of the Rajya Sabha 2003 to 2009, and concurrently the director of NIAS Bangalore, and subsequently member of the erstwhile planning commission. His interests include astrophysics, space science and technology, as well as science-related policies. Dr. Kasuri Rangan is a member of several international and national science academies, and has won many distinguished awards for his professional achievements, including the Shanti Swaru Bhatnagar Award in Engineering, the Alan D. Emil Memorial Award of the International Astronautical Federation 2004, 
the Theodore von Karman Award by International Academy of Astronautics 2007, and the Lifetime Achievement Award of Asia Pacific Satellite Communications Council Singapore, among others. He has been conferred with the highest civilian honors, Padma Shri, Padma Bhushan, and Padma Vibhushan by the President of India, and the award of the Officer of the Légion d'Honneur by the President of the French Republic, France. We are very privileged uh, to have you here. And I must mention that Dr. Uh, Kasuri Rangan readily agreed to our invitation. There was absolutely no back and forth. And we are very uh, grateful uh, to him uh, for agreeing to come here. Uh, before we begin, I'd request uh, Professor Tribedi to greet uh, Dr. Kasuri Rangan with, uh, with flowers and, and also to say a few words. <clears throat> Good evening to you all. Uh, dear friends, uh, Dr. Kasturi Rangan, Dr. Kakodkar, respected family members of uh, Shri Kulkarni, um, and all my dear colleagues and friends. Uh, you know, I, I won't take up very much of your time. I just wanted to say this is a very special occasion, as Ravi said, for all of us uh, to gather and uh, remember uh, a real uh, inspiration to us all, uh, Sri Kulkarni, and to think about all that he contributed to TIFR and the country. And so I'm very happy myself to be here. I also take this opportunity to welcome actually two very respected and senior uh, people in the science community, Dr. Kasturi Rangan and Dr. Kakodkar here in our midst. I'm very thankful to Dr. Kasturi Rangan for sparing the time to come and deliver this uh, lecture. We look forward to your thoughts and uh, to this title, which is, uh, we know you've been so closely associated with the space program, so it's a real privilege to be able to hear from you. And I also thank Dr. Kakodkar for sparing the time to be here in our midst this afternoon. Um, I should say to you all that uh, both Dr. Kakotkar and Dr. Kasturi Rangan have played a very important role in guiding TIFR. Uh, Dr. Kasturi Rangan is currently on the Council of Management of TIFR for several years. And I can tell you, since it's been my privilege to be with him on the council, that his uh, role there has been absolutely pivotal in guiding the institution and guiding me personally. And so thank you for that as well. I take this opportunity to thank you. And also Dr. Kakurkar, for many years, as you know, was chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission and on TIFR's council. And again, we benefited enormously and continue to benefit from his guidance. So thank you, too, for that. So with that, I hand it over to Ravi. Just a quick reminder that uh, we are also live streaming this talk. And uh, if any of you would like to communicate with your friends, it's on live stream on uh, the HBCSC TFR Facebook page, which is the official Facebook page. So you can direct any of your friends to that, and it will be on there. Th it, the lecture will also be available uh, afterwards on HBCSC's YouTube channel. I welcome uh, Dr. Kasir Rangan to give the talk. Dr. Subramaniam, my dear long-term colleague and friend, Dr. Kakodkar, Sandeep, Professor Sandeep Trivedi, members of the Professor V.G. Kulkarni family, other distinguished invitees, students, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, let me express my grateful thanks to Professor Subramaniam for 
inviting me to deliver this annual feature, the Professor V.G. Kulkarni Memorial Lecture. Of course, he said that I readily agreed. Uh, but there are names and institutions in this country which have come into being with a purpose, which has in many ways not only justified their existence, but far outperformed their expectations, unique in nature, coming out of out of box and innovative thinking, and contributing significantly to one of the most important endeavors of this country, the education. I don't think that we have to put these criteria and ask a name of an institution that comes to your mind. This is the institution that one talks of. So there is no question, there is no apology from anybody with respect to accepting an invitation from you, Professor Subramaniam, on this occasion. I'm extremely happy that my friend, Professor Kakodkar is here with us today. You know, when I say his friend and colleague and all that, it may it should not be looking platitudinous. We have been together. I was the, when he was the chairman of Atomic Energy Commission, I was the chairman of the Space Commission. We had a very long stint together, coordinating, working together. And in fact, I should say, he opened up several aspects of Atomic Energy program, which was an eye-opener to me. In fact, for the first time, the space started really seriously looking at working together with Atomic Energy. It was his initiative, whether it is related to the computer development, whether it is related to simulation, whether it is related to material development, solar energy systems, radioisotope system. I remember many of these wide number of things in which we wanted to work together. We had our ambitions to work together. And I am sure that it continues today, but it was a very unique experience to have worked with him. But the thing didn't stop there. When I went to the Rajya Sabha, he was grappling with the nuclear deal. And it was my habit to call him up too often. Sometimes probably it should be it would have even irritated him to the extent of trying to get clarifications from him. And it was an extraordinary period for the atomic energy program. And he was really at the hem of affairs at that particular point. And I, as a representative in the parliament, used to articulate whatever, now I can say this, articulate whatever he wanted. So that is the amount of influence he had with me with respect to this. And so on the ultimate talk, which I gave on the any 230, it was almost 29 minutes I got to speak. We, like nominated members, can speak not more than five to six minutes in Rajya Sabha. And that day, I got 15, 29 minutes simply because of the fact that I was echoing the view with the Congress thought it is theirs. Uh, it was echoing my view and that of atomic energy and that of Dr. Kakodkar. So I mentioned it in the lecture that it is people like Professor Kakodkar that has made this possible. So I very much remember this. And of course, we continue to associate ourselves even now. So the question of being a colleague and a long-term friend, I think is even contemporary and currently also valid. That is the value that I attach to my association with Dr. Kakodkar. So when I asked him, oh, you could find time to come here, he said, what do, what do you talk about like this? Why are you talking like this? So that is the kind of person he is. I'm extremely happy that I'm here on this day, the day to remember. And I understand this also happens to be the birthday of uh, Professor Kulkarni. And so what a privilege to be talking on this day on a subject, of course, the subject is on space. When you invited me, I thought that I should be speaking on the India's policy on education. And uh, I thought by the time the date arrives, things will be cleared so that we can maybe talk about it without any kind of inhibitions. But that was not to be. And still the report has to be submitted. There are the further presentations and uh, further procedures that we have to complete before we can consider that the report is final and accepted. And until that, it will be difficult for me to speak about it, even though most of it is all in place. So I'm sorry that I could not really take advantage of this invitation uh, to talk for the first time in this institute about India's education policy because of the constraints of schedules and uh, certain other formalities to be completed. 
But nevertheless, I thought that I should choose a subject. I went through all the list of people who have talked in the earlier, very eminent people, extraordinary topics they have touched upon. But one thing I found that there was a gap. There was no mention of anywhere a presentation on the space program. I thought, and that is of course right now being discussed quite a lot in the newspapers and in other places. So I thought this is the right time for me to say a few words about India's space program. Uh, not only with respect to what is happening presently, but also a little bit about the past, because that is very important for our program, simply because of the fact that we laid the type of groundwork that was laid by the pioneers of India's space program certainly has its impact on the sustainability that one is witnessing of this activity today. And also the type of planning that we are trying to do for the future. So keep this, keeping this mind and also my own comfort in dealing with this subject, I thought I should use this opportunity to speak uh, on the India space. Uh, I will start with the initial uh, um, developments that happen as a part of the space program elsewhere. You know, this, if one really looks back at the history of the space exploration, it could be dated back to something like 1947, 1948 kind of period, when uh, the first of the balloons and the rockets were flown. And the whole idea was to carry instrument to the fringes of the atmosphere, about 100 kilometers or so. That is a rough definition of where the atmosphere ends and the space begins. So that is roughly the period. That is the period 1947 when this activity started. The idea was to understand a little bit on the geological, geophysical aspects of the Earth, to look at the sun as an object to be studied because it is the closest star, and also certain other astronomical observations which are not amenable to be seen from the ground. So keeping these in mind, the early exploration using balloons and rockets and has been one of the key elements of starting the program in the way in which we understand the space today. Of course, when the first of the satellite was orbited, the Sputnik 9, October 4, 1947, the and also closely followed by the United States then, by in 1958, they flew their own satellite. It was thought that here is a good, a new era, as the first vantage point of space is being opened up for looking at areas which have been beyond the Earth's vicinity and therefore opens up very many possibilities. In this context, these were the area times of Cold, Cold War and the, inter the interest of the United States, which was immediately interpreted, and that too of the then Soviet Union, that they wanted to establish the rigor principle that the altitudes at which the satellites orbit are beyond the national regimes of any country. And therefore, you are free to fly there, do what you want there, and it doesn't come under any kind of a legal constraint. So that was understood. And considering that it was a Cold War era, this fitted well with the other objective, that of snooping into the territory of the, uh, your adversary uh, with satellite bound camera systems. And so, in a sense, this was one of the key drivers of the early part of the space program, uh, which was an extension into space of the Cold War era between the United States and the then Soviet Union. But at the same time, of course, there were, one was not losing sight of the fact that there were very interesting possibilities of looking at the atmospheric regime, the ionospheric regime, and the space regime beyond, and the interplanetary medium, that a possibility access to the space really opens up. So, but then, so there was this dual purpose, the Cold War era, and the advantages of flying satellites in a regime where the legal principles of international legal principles do not apply. And on the other side, the very potential ways in which the exploration can be further extended with uh, very interesting possibilities on the scientific front. On the other side, if you really look at the Indian perspective, and this I should say started with something like 1963 when the first of the rockets were flown from India, our idea was that it has to have, it, it will have this vantage point of space once it is opened up, once we able to master this particular vantage point, 
we can have objectives which are one of course scientific that everybody understands and the socio-economic objectives. In fact, only two countries in the world at the time really had the peaceful objectives, the India and Japan, in terms of exploiting the space uh, in ter uh, in for purposes which are beyond the military. So that's why I put it as scientific and ob economic objectives uh, here and that is how it, it, it started. It's not coming up. Can somebody help me to, it's not moving. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. So, how does the story begin? So, far as India is concerned, uh, the first of the rockets were launched from the Tumba Equatorial Rocket Launching Station. Why Tumba was chosen is one question that one can ask. This is one of the location, a, a location, a geographic location on one side, but more importantly, a geomagnetic location where the uh, the geomagnetic equator, you know the Earth's uh, geographic equator is there, there is also a geomagnetic equator if you consider the Earth as a dipole magnet and then if you try to put the latitude longitude around that kind of a dipole magnet, then the equatorial aspect uh, part of it goes through Tumba. So, it really triggers this, this presence of an equatorial uh, the geomagnetic equator over Tumba triggers a variety of phenomena, especially in the regions of the atmosphere, which you called as the ion, uh, ionized or ionosphere. So, that was actually one of the motivations of starting the India space program, because we had this interesting geophysical resource. Sarabhai, the India space pioneer, I show him here, his photograph here, said about the, this starting this, he was the pioneer, he thought about what India can do and will you see a little bit of his own vision about this. But the most important thing is, when he started this, there were, as usual, many questions of why are we going to splurge our money into this kind of an activity. And uh, that, to, to find one of the speeches around the time 1963, 1964, 65, he said this while addressing the United Nations uh, on the justification for a developing country, at that time a developing country like India. There are some who question the relevance of space activities in a developing nation. We were to play a meaningful role nationally and in the Committee of Nations. We must be second to none in the application of advanced technologies to the real problems of man and the society. So that was his justification in a very, very uh, simplistic as well as in a abbre abbreviated way. But what he knew is that whereas science can drive the initial part of the program, one can exploit the questions of the, uh, the ideas related to the scientific problems of the geomagnetic equator and above in the atmosphere. And also, one can look at the southern sky from Tumba, which you cannot see in the northern part of the world. And therefore, you can have a good feel of the astronomical objects in the southern sky. There is another kind of a thing you can do by flying rockets in Tumba. He knew ultimately, this kind of justification cannot sustain itself until we have a strong socio-economic front to this. And so he knew that there are many possibilities with respect to tangible social benefits that such a space program can bring. Uh, there were questions of tele te te telecommunications, connectivity between different locations of the country, timely, accurate and precise information about natural resources, strengthening the agricultural system by looking at the meteorology and the ability for the synoptic view from space of looking at the meteorological phenomena. So, there were many socio-economic objectives that he foresaw in the vantage point of space. So, he knew that. Of course, there were many intangible. There were the technological capability and intangible objective could be made. The economic, beyond the socio-economic part of it. Uh, the leadership, which it can create uh, in, the, in the context of carrying out an ab ab objective in space. You have several aspects of institutions and groups coming together. So, there is a question of a leadership that uh, which is needed specifically for this kind of activity and then multiple institutions and self then the most important thing he knew also knew that ultimately because you knew people also knew that it is a extension of the military objectives in the case of Soviet Union and it will have also a long term military and a strategic objective 
So self-reliance is extremely important. Otherwise, at the most critical moment, India could be denied of technology. India could be denied of a certain critical capability, which could even affect its socio-economic development. So these were the kind of thing that he had in mind. So he drew, he really drew up an exceptional vision, keeping this aspect of it. So the program we started in 1963 with the launch of the sounding rocket to look at the upper atmosphere has now grown, evolved in several dimensions. And today, nearly 55 years after the first rocket was fired, if you really look at what have we done in the last 55 years, you can just give you some feel of it in this particular slide, which is that we had something like we, are, we developed our own launch vehicles. And today you hear very often about the polar satellite launch vehicle the vehicle which is able to push uh, multi-ton multi satellites in the near Earth orbits and also geosynchronous missions and so on. We had something like 67 launch vehicle missions until recently uh, over the last 55 years. And we had a fairly high success rate. And this I should say, uh, especially con considering the fact that space has got a risk element. But over the years, after the initial setbacks that we had with respect to the smaller vehicles called the satellite launch vehicle SLV-3 or the ASLV, the PSLV and beyond, we have been having a remarkable set of successes because we have tried to understand and overcome many of the earlier issues of uh, bottlenecks that we had to meet in the launch vehicle development. So today we have one of the finest records in terms of launching success successfully uh, satellites. The budget we started with few, cro few crores in 1960s today has become 1.4 billion in the annual budget of the space. And we have a very high level of application leadership. I want to talk about application because that is the one that really sustains and justifies the space program. And I mentioned about the vision of Sarabhai of the socioeconomic development. Here is this very specific example of the application leadership that we have. You see some of the applications, the use of space by stakeholders outside ISRO with respect to their own requirements of uh, a certain type of goals. Then, of course, we have also grown over the years. The industry which is very extremely important because we knew that space by itself cannot do all the things that it is expected to do unless you have partnership in industry. There are something like 500 industries. They work together with ISRO today, 500 uh, small industries, about 70, 80 medium industries, and about 15 big industries. So they all come together in supporting India's space program. One of the hallmark of this space program has been the international collaboration. Uh, the space certainly is a strategic aspect, but India's political equations and the early association with some of the countries like Soviet Union, United States, Japan, Germany, and so on, certainly was has now today grown into something like collaboration with 30 or 35 countries uh, with whom we worked on various types of program, whether it is related to the technology, development of satellites, supply of satellites, use of satellites, and so on and so forth. And in the, in the process, we also have launched something like 97 satellites uh, with our vehicle. And of course, another 237, of course, these are smaller satellites. Uh, you know, there was one single shot in which 104 satellites were launched into the orbit. So that is a kind of a thing that uh, we have been also able to do in trying to provide support to international uh, space activities. I'm sorry, something is. Is it coming back again? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's okay. And uh, then, of course, self-reliance, I said, state of art, human resources. Today, we have something like 18,000 people who work within ISRO and an equal number who work in the industries and in other institutions. Space commerce is taking over slowly in the context of our ability to share the capabilities with other institutions and other countries and also provide it at a cost. So you have a commerce element which need to be grown further in the coming years and large user base. The most important thing I said is the justification of the space activity because of the presence of a large user base in the country, both governmental as well as non-governmental system. And in all these, we have built up both within the organization and outside the organization a fairly large infrastructure which together represent an end-to-end -end capability. So what are the kind of things that uh, currently uh, we are involved? If you really ask me at this stage, uh, we have five major programs of ISRO. 
One is of course those related to the use of satellites for communication, broadcasting and navigation. The second is to look at from the, from the, from the, from the, from the local vantage point of space, the ground and look at the various features of the ground, the resources on the ground, uh, the various types of land applications which you call as a remote sensing. Then space transportation, I said that we need to have a self-reliance in the context of ability to place the satellite at the appropriate orbits and we have to develop our own launch vehicle for that and we have reasonably well now covered good ground in terms of the PSLV, the, the PSLV, the GSLV and also the advanced versions of the geosynchronous satellite launch vehicles. And of course, the most important aspect is the utilization of some of these things in the context of tangible applications on the ground, whether it is in communication, broadcasting, navigation, or remote sensing, and also a fairly good scientific support in terms of scientists coming forward to use the, use the space for areas of astronomy, aeronomy, atmospheric sciences, solar physics, and things of that kind. I may also add, since this particular slide was made, and the Prime Minister made a major announcement in the last Independence Day and that is the question of India going into the human space flight. And this he has given a very, very challenging schedule for the human space flight. And this is now added as one of the key and major program uh, so far as the uh, space is concerned. I will say a little bit about it as we move further. This is the picture of an Indian remote sensing satellite. The why I want to say a little bit about the Indian remote sensing satellite is, you will see that we started with a very limited capability in this. At the time when there were two major space powers who built the most sophisticated remote sensing satellites, the Americans as well as the French. They built the satellites which has got something like a resolution, which means if you put a camera in the space, which is about at 900 kilometers to 1000 kilometers, and take the pictures, you can get features on the pictures, features on the picture which can be as fine as between 20 meters to 30 meters and over an area which could be something like 200 kilometers. So that is a kind of a perspective view with the details that you look for on the land. <clears throat> so that is what it is this kind of a thing. It needed a tremendous amount of new technologies that we brought to bear. And when we try to really look at the technologies that you need for this, they were still not, they were simply not available. I'll give one example of the type of technology that goes into a satellite like a ERS, uh, which is a, a, what you call as a dry tuned gyroscope. The gyroscope is an inertial sensor and uh, you know it goes in a high speed and therefore like a top, it maintains a certain spinning axis orientation and any disturbance in that particular thing, it can be detected, it can be corrected and this principle can be used to create a reference with respect to certain pointing requirements. And then similarly, there are many other landmarks in space, infrared horizon of the Earth, or stellar, uh, stellar references, or the uh, sun's reference, and so on and so forth. So these kind of things are fairly sophisticated electro-optical, electromechanical, and mechanical systems like gyroscopes. And these are zealously guarded technologies because it so happens the gyroscopes are also a part of an inertial navigation system which can guide a missile from point A to point B and then also used in aircrafts, uh, things like Boeing 747 or 777, they carry the carousel navigation system which also uses similar kind of gyroscopes. So they are simply not available. They have to be built from the scratch. They were to be learned from textbook principles. So these kind of things were the kind of technology that we had to master. We had to also make sure that the camera systems have to be ultimately of the capability that we have the best in the world. But at the same time, we had a satellite which has been put into a PSLV class of a vehicle which could accommodate only smaller volumes, smaller weights, and therefore they had to be compacted. We came out with something which was incredibly new and innovative in terms of camera system, the optics particularly. And in fact, uh, somebody from Tata Institute, George Joseph, was one of the key persons in the development of camera systems. Uh, in Israel in those years. So these kind of things. So these are all the kind of challenges we met in the initial stages and uh, optical sensors were built. Later on microwave sensors were built. The difference between optical and microwave is because of the fact that optical really uses the reflected light from the ground to get the capture the picture. Whereas if you use microwave it's an active system so it uses its own radiation 
and so you, you don't have the problem of cloudiness and other kinds of things or day night effects and so on. And then also you use infrared systems where you can get the temperature part of it and therefore you look at the health of the vegetation and things of that kind. So there are all these areas of wavelengths, domains and the visible, the infrared, the middle infrared, the thermal infrared, the microwave, these have been all now mastered by ISRO in trying to develop the Indian remote sensing satellite series. So how, do, how it has grown? We started with the first of the satellite, which is about one kilometer resolution in Bhaskara. Then we went to the IRS. When we built the first of the IRS series, we came nearly to the level of Americans and French. I want to say this because in a period of eight to nine years, we built a capability in remote sensing which became comparable to the best in the world, which was the IRS 1A and 1B. Then we took up a challenge that they have to be better than even the best in the world, and that is the IRS 1C and 1D with 23 meters, 5 meters, and things of that kind. And since then, there has been no stopping us. We have been all through going through 1 meter systems, the sub-meter systems. We have been building systems with uh, remote, uh, radar systems. We have been dealing with the hypersex spectral spectrum, very high resolution in wavelength uh, to look at mineralogy and things of that kind. So there is a whole class of remote sensing capabilities today India possesses. And in the process, it has a constellation of satellites covering these kind of spatial, spectral, temporal resolutions, which puts it at the best in the civilian world of satellite remote sensing. I want to say this with pride because of the fact all this happened in the matter of 20 to 25 years. I would like to now <coughs> show this with the, some of the pictures. This is the South Bombay. So you can see this is a 5 meter resolution from one of the Indian satellites. The other one is a 1 meter resolution again taken by another of the Indian satellites. This is in the Orambic China. It's an airport and you can see the details that you can see at the airport. And even the more details you can see lower side. In fact, you can look at an aircraft and look at the two engines. There's a twin engine aircraft or a, this thing all from 900 kilometers. So that is a kind of today the capability the country has when you talk of uh, satellite imaging and satellite remote sensing. This is another thing just to give you a feel. It's, it's, it's less of a, you know, it's a five meter resolution, but you can see how beautiful it captures the Middle East Palm Jumeirah. And I think it's in the Middle East uh, with our IRS, uh, one of the remote sensing satellites. Now, what is it used for really? Now, today we use it for a variety of applications. I won't go into the details of this, but I can say that we use it for agricultural production. What we try to do is to look at the crop growth cycle with satellites because there is a repetitivity that is possible. It has a wavelength range, wavelength range which is appropriate for looking at the crop growth and the corresponding spectral variations in it. And it can also look at a fairly large area. So this is a very unique capability to look at agricultural growth, agricultural um, the, 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 the maturity, and before you go into the harvesting, uh, you can have a reasonably good prediction of what the yield is going to be. So one of the key elements of India's capability is in the area of production and production and prediction of agricultural yield, at least in some eight or nine major crops like wheat, rice, uh, sorghum, and so on and so forth. So that is one aspect of it in which today we have an operational capability. It is also passed on to the Ministry of Agriculture and it also is the major source of information with respect to the Bureau of Economics and Statistics who get this to the accuracy that they are looking for 95% accuracy and 95% accuracy. So that is the kind of a thing. Of course, it does a lot of other things, watershed development, production estimation, corporate acreage and so on and so forth. I won't go into the details. So similarly, in the environment, you have forest cover estimation, forest mensuration, and look at it. In fact, every two years we place in the parliament the state of health of forest of India, how much of the forest is getting denuded, what is the forestation strategy and things of that kind. And also now we do the biodiversity. So you can look at the various types of flora and fauna up to a certain landscape, uh, first, first level landscape identification. So that is another possibility. Coastal region, we have the potential fishery zones. In fact, fishermen today routinely use satellite information in trying to locate the potential schools of fishing. The satellite information here is nothing but the, I, I mentioned about the high spectral resolution. So you can look at the phytoplankton in the ocean. This phytoplankton distribution is the fodder to the fish. 
and also that along with the temperature to which the species is very sensitive, the temperature of the ocean, uh, we try to create maps. And these maps are used to guide where exactly the potential course of fishing is there. So you don't have to have a search space and you produce a valuable time, you reduce the time for search to a minimal level using this kind of a thing. So there is another kind of a thing, coastal zone mapping, land and water, hydrogeomorphological map, the identification of the groundwater and how do you try to increase the probability of heating water in the ground uh, groundwater uh, by using the hydrogeomorphological map that make that you make out of the satellite pictures. These are many of the applications. I just wanted to give you a little feel of the type of societal relevance today of the Indian remote sensing uh, satellite capability. Now I go to the other area which is the communication, broadcasting and satellite. Of course, communication was one of the early applications to which it was recognized. Sarabai recognized the importance of this with respect to improving the uh, country's connectivity. We have today three types of communication configuration. A configuration which allows you to have communication and broadcasting. A second one is a multi-mission. Here the advantage is that you try to put three instruments, communication payload, broadcasting payload, and a payload for taking the pictures of the meteorological phenomena. Meteorological phenomena are typically continental in terms of looking at the various features of meteorological. So we have this kind of very high resolution radiometers which can take the picture for example from Horn of Africa to the west coast of Australia. So you can get a single picture of INSAT, Indian National Satellite, where you can get the entire development of a meteorological phenomena with that kind of a perspective. And then of course the satellite navigation which is now a successor to the, 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 the now, now star system or the GLONASS system of Soviet of, uh, Russia and more recently Galileo of Europe. Uh, we are also going for a regional navigation system. There is the third configuration of a communication satellite that we have. And so these are the three types of communication systems which we build regularly. These have typically a lifetime of 12 years. We have to place it in a geosynchronous orbit or in a highly elliptical orbit as is the case with navigation. And from the geosynchronous orbit, it acts as a tall tower at 36,000 kilometers so that you can have a point to point connection, point to multi point connection, or a multi point to multi point. So, you have got all kinds of possibilities in terms of connectivity using satellite. And of course, uh, we are all familiar with it you know, when we talk of a satellite based communication system for improving telephony, telephone broadcasting, and things of that kind. These are some of the most important applications to which. It has been used over the years, television, telephony, I don't have to go, to go into the details of the societal. Telehealth and teleeducation also, we have experimented with it. How do you make sure that you have the necessary support of a healthcare system at the rural doorstep with the best of the medical knowledge that is available in the urban area? So that's kind of a thing which is the tele, and similar thing with respect to teleeducation. Then you have the mobile satellite service, and since I said that, we have also in such communication system, geosynchronous missions, also instruments for weather and climate. That is another major support that it gives. And ultimately, of course, communication system, the weather system, and the remote sensing system together can form what you call as a disaster, is an important component of what you call as a disaster management. You can look at the emergency communication, disaster warning system. I will see, you will see some of those in the actual pictures. Uh, this is of course the teleeducation. There are something like 60,000 classrooms, virtual classrooms connected via satellite to uh, the two, one location where you have a teacher and with whom the students in different classrooms can interact all across the country. So this kind of a thing has already been promoted. About 60,000 classrooms are working in the EJUSAT network. On the other side, you have also the specialty hospital which provides you the telemedicine. Uh, 66 specialty hospitals in major countries connected to something like 300 hospitals at rural and rural. So this is the connectivity between the urban and the rural area to provide the best of the medical knowledge in the urban area into the rural thing. And also they have put through the satellite connectivity things like uh, 17 mobile telemedicine tele 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 so unit. This is the various aspects of a disaster management support services that the space systems have been able to provide nowadays. Cyclone tracking and landfall, this is, you can virtually see the cyclone moving towards the coast and where exactly, and within 50 kilometers today, there is a possibility of locating the landfall or where it will hit the cyclone, the cyclone will hit. Flood management, you can really look at the water flow characteristics where you have to put bund and so on. And so you have a whole host of quick 
information system centered around the geographic information system in trying to understand the level of flooding, the level of damage and also the type of damage items which have been damaged. So you have a flood management input that is available to that. Similarly, you have also for drought monitoring and assessment, you use pictures, okay, remote sensing pictures, which has got the infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum, which can identify the level of water stress that the plants have. So you have a means of doing a drought monitoring and you can virtually do this every week to get the growth of a drought and you can create what is called as a drought bulletins which the state governments and the central government can use to look at what corrective steps they have to take if we want to get over some of these problems. Some, many of them are amenable uh, for early actions. Forest fire alerts, landslides, databases and international commitments are some of the other things that uh, disaster management support service of which the space systems today pl uh, play a key role. You can just see a type of picture that inside a shot of the Fallin cyclone. This is of course an earlier picture, October 2013. But you can see the details that you can get including the eye of the cyclone, very clearly visible. So these kind of things are very virtually taken every half an hour or you can even take it every 15 minutes. See the tracking of that movement of the, uh, the movement of the, uh, of the cyclonic uh, condition. And you can also use with the simulation uh, in the meteorological uh, systems uh, to identify which is the most possible location for a landfall and therefore you can take sufficiently early preemptive steps to reduce the loss both of lives and property. So that is the kind of a thing that one is talking about. I come to the third element of the space program, the space science. If you really look at India's uh, space related activity it has got virtually every platform that is possible is used. Ground based systems, you have got radio astronomy telescope of TIFR is a classic example and then optical telescopes, you can see it in Udaipur. Then you have got balloon bond systems, again TIFR has developed balloon bond systems to look at in the higher, higher altitudes, maybe 30, 40 kilometers kind of a thing, both for astronomy as well as for atmospheric sciences. And then you talk of rockets, you can go up to areas like, uh, because one of the important thing about going for higher altitudes is the fact that we are really talking of overcoming the blanketing effect of the atmosphere and therefore what you cannot see on the ground which is mainly x-rays, ultraviolet, certain parts of the infrared part of the spectrum, the microwaves, uh, then gamma rays and higher energy x-rays. These are areas which cannot be got from the ground simply because of the absorption of the atmosphere. So as you go up then this blanketing effect reduces further and further and so more and more our astronomy uh, regimes open up. So you have the gamma rays, x-rays and things of that kind. So today India has got all the important platforms whether it is from the ground based system, balloon based system, rocket based system, satellite based system and conduct a variety of space science experiments which would be related to astronomy and astrophysics, planetary atmospheres and aeronomy, uh, sciences and solar system studies and of course simulation, modeling, theoretical studies and so on and so forth. And because of this entire gamut of capabilities covering different regimes in terms of the altitudes in which you can deploy the instruments. We have been also part of very important international uh, programs like the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, International Middle Atmosphere Program, ISTEP, Indo-X, they, 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 they try to look at the forcing functions in the atmosphere uh, with respect to aerosol uh, dominated uh, forcing functions. So that kind of a thing. I come in this process to some of the more recent initiatives that ISRO has taken uh, in the context of uh, space science. And uh, what uh, one can see here is of course we have Chandrayaan which was uh, flown in 2008 that was the first uh, major planetary mission which ISRO undertook. They had something like 11 instruments to look at the various aspects of the topography of the moon, the mineralogy of the moon and many other aspects of the lunar uh, the f f physical, chemical uh, information and also to look at uh, things like water. So that is the kind of a thing. Uh, we, I'll, I'll say a little bit about it and also the Mars mission uh, and also AstroSat because AstroSat particularly is because Tata Institute has been very actively involved in realizing this satellite. In fact, bulk of the instruments that uh, came out of AstroSat was from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. And uh, then of course currently in planning are three important missions. One is Chandrayaan-2, uh, 
the second is Aditya and uh, third one uh, there is a lunar mission uh, there is a solar mission and ultimate there is also one which is not put here which is an X-ray polarimeter that we want to fly which is being designed and developed by the Raman Research Institute in Bangalore. Uh, Chandrayaan 2 it is going to be a four ton system it will have an orbiter, a lander and a rover and it will have at least a one year orbital life and uh, the lander itself will have something like one lunar day this is what is something like 13 earth days that is a kind of a thing and uh, of course the lander we have named after because this happened next year happens to be the 100th birthday of the India space pioneer Dr. Vikram Sarabhai so the lander of Chandrayaan 2 will be named as the Vikram lander so under uh, after uh, Vikram Sarabhai and it will have something like 13 instruments that will be flown in the three elements that is the orbital uh, uh, version, the lander version as well as uh, ultimately the, uh, the rover version. It will do work on topography, mineralogy, surface, chemical composition, thermophysical properties and things of that kind. So the fundamental thing is that there will be enough of data to provide further steps towards understanding the origin and evolution of the moon which is still a debated problem with respect to uh, the moon's origin and in a sense that also puts uh, certain questions regarding a proper understanding of the theory of evolution of the earth itself. On the other side we are also developing a, 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 a satellite which will particularly look at the solar physics, the photosphere, the chromosphere and the solar corona region. Now it is going to be called as Aditya. Initially we thought it will be an orbiting system with only a coronagraph. Right on reviewing the program, it was decided that we will make it into a 1.5 ton uh, heavy satellite with and which can be located in the Lagrangian point 1 of the solar system. You know the Lagrangian points are very interesting points in the solar system. At those points if you want to put an object, it will, it will work with earth and the moon or earth and the sun and in a, in, in a synchronous manner. So there is no relative motion. Uh, between an object in the Lagrangian point 1 with respect to the sun and the earth. So that is the point, it is about 1.5 million uh, kilometers away. So there will be a fairly heavy launch vehicle that will take this particular uh, subject satellite Aditya and it will have instruments as I said with respect to photospheric, chromospheric and uh, coronal studies and this is stated for 2020. So this is the other part. The third, third of the missions that I would like to mention this is again a futuristic mission is the X-ray polarimeter that is being developed is a, is a smaller satellite about 300, 400 kilometers. The most important thing about uh, the polarimeter is that so far the astronomy in X-ray domain has been one of looking at the intensity, one of looking at uh, the spectrum, look at the spatial, the imaging part of it. The fourth dimension of what is, what about the polarization? has been unanswered. It has not been studied mainly because of the fact that you need a very different regime of sensitivity and the ability to detect the and differentiate uh, between the polarized uh, radiation from the nominal as well as uh, other means. So there is a big challenge in that. Tarman Research Institute has come out with a very viable instrument with the necessary uh, the sensitivity. They say that between 5 keV and 30 keV they have an instrument which is of course it depends on the fundamental principle of the X-ray scattering, the Thomson scattering which provides the necessary capability in terms of uh, the polarization and this is going to be one of the major instruments and probably one of the major missions in the world which will for the first time go with that type of sensitivity that one is looking for in to look at the polarization and it will provide you really the important thing is under the extreme magnetic conditions under the extreme gravity conditions, what will be the nature of the radiation, what will be the emission characteristics and what are the regimes in which this kind of emissions can take place for this radiation. These are the questions that uh, one would seek for this. I would go quickly to the other things when Chandrayaan is a mission that has completely been over now. The important point I would like to say is that this mission certainly was one of the first few to detect the water on the moon. So hydroxyl and water has been one of the major things. It also studied things like uh, the solar uh, uh, wind, especially protons, solar protons 
which when uh, when it, when it gets and gets into the solar uh, lunar surface they are able to extract the electron and they go as a neutral hydrogen 25% of the solar wind protons are today returned back into the space uh, as uh, neutral hydrogen so it's a very interesting observation that was made out of it there are of course there are many other things crystalline fields but lunar the i mean the lunar lunar magma ocean hypothesis and that is a uh, important index for that then crater geometry is another kind of a thing buried lava but i here you can i can see i have summarized the 11 instrument that has gone on for on this most important thing is five of the five of the instruments were built by us spacecraft were designed and built by us the entire mission was conducted by us what i mean by mission is the fact you see how the orbit has been raised initially around the earth uh, to increasing apogee and then ultimately it put is in a trans lunar injection orbit and then insertion into the lunar orbit and ultimately bring it closer to the moon uh, in terms of nearly 100 km in fact i should say to keep an object very close to the moon at 100 km is more difficult than allowing the moon object to crash on the moon so it is so complicated in terms of the compli- uh, calculations but that was what was done by the chandrayaan 1 and it has produced some very interesting results Uh, which has been app- um, appropriately uh, pre- pre- presented in the peer reviewed journals all over the world this is of course the kangalayan the one which went up to 400 million kilometers it took 300 days to travel that interplanetary regime uh, from earth to mars uh, of course many many things had to be done first time uh, things like artificial intelligence expert systems uh, deep space communication network and the ability to communicate with the satellite Uh, once it is near the mars because it takes 22 minutes for a signal to reach mars and get a reply so obviously you cannot do any real time uh, control on the satellite so you need to put those things in a, it has the on the satellite has to look for problems it has to diagnose the problem analyze the problem and immediately put the corrective say that's what i said expert systems artificial intelligence this were all built into this is one of the futuristic missions in terms of india's ability to do the planetary mission of course it also carried five instruments lemon photometer mars color camera methane sensor thermal infrared and so on and very interesting results of course have come so several tens of papers have been published in your journal of geophysical research planetary planetary letters and things of that kind and uh, i won't go into the details of the scientific basis of this uh, but what is important is it really puts us at a bleak because it is also said that is the first time uh, that we were any incarnation was successful in inserting an object into the planetary uh, regime uh, without either it getting cr- crashed or getting escape out of uh, getting an escape velocity so that the very fact that it went exactly into the orbit in the very first attempt show the intricate calculation that were carried out by these rocket scientists certainly have been validated in the success uh, so the last of the astrosat is still very much in the picture several papers are coming out i think nalin will be, the the sandeep will be able to say more about it more than 500 in, um, objects have been studied whether it is related to neutron star based system gap gap systems uh, with bla- with black holes with uv at with the with the with the, from the flag of the fast fluctuations that is typical of the even horizon near the black hole these are kind of thing that have been detected and what is also very interesting is something that is unexpected but then it came out was an instrument called uh, cadmium, uh, cadmium zinc telluride which was built by the tata institute uh, group uh, they have been able to look at uh, polarization in the crab a 33 millisecond pulsar and they have been able to see for the first time concrete positive evidence of the polarization from crab uh, coming out of this is spin off really but nevertheless it was detected so that's a very interesting and this will be the precursor to the x-ray polarimeter which that uh, raman research institute is building uh, for the next uh, in the next two years to be launched uh, this is the fourth element of the space program which is of the advanced access to space and so you have the pslv currently operational as i said it can take it 1.2 tons in the geosynchronous transfer orbit or 3.5 tons into the leo but primarily it is used for polar mission that is a mission in which the orbit is from pole to pole the advantage of a pole to pole mission is the fact that if you put a camera in such a satellite the earth is uh, rotates below this because that is the 24 hour rotation 
the orbit it's the first approximation is fixed in the inertial space so with respect to that you can start scanning the earth from of different locations so that is how the remote sensing covers the whole of the globe by being in one orbit but then there are small corrections to be applied on the orbit simply because of the fact earth is not a per sphere sphere so all those alexander polynomials that you develop just got higher harmonics so you have the problems of that so obviously you need to have uh, corrections and those corrections are appropriately applied to maintain the sun synchronism the another important thing is the orbit has to be sun synchronous so that the the ray comes the sun solar rays comes at a particular point on the ground um, at a constant angle so that the vagaries or the, the the ambiguities that come out of varying solar angle uh, which also can complicate the interpretation of the image is avoided so sun synchronism polar orbit these are some the orbital correction these are some of the challenges of having a pslv mission has been a very successful mission gslv the next version with a heavy heavy satellite uh, satellite launcher go taking up to geosynchronous orbit 2.5 tons in gtu and 5 tons it can go into the lower the earth orbit then currently the going to be a very important is almost i always consider it as the equivalent of a 747 boeing which is the gslv mark 3 Uh, which is a 4.5 it will have a 10 ton into the leo and this is the one that will be man rated uh, to go for the first of the india's uh, manned mission so the vehicle has been already proved with respect to the regular use now they will have to put it into the man rating process uh, but the engineers are very confident that that's not going to be a major challenge the whole idea of man rating is that you have acceleration you have the shocks and you have uh, uh, you have acceleration and shock and uh, therefore you have to make sure that they are kept within certain level by means of appropriate design and of course the reliability is the most important thing but then there are enough redundancies and other kinds of features that you build up in this kind of a vehicle and uh, of course the next one currently under development in isro is the semi cryogenic system which is a 6 ton under the gto which is again will be a human rated one which is a geoselva semi cryogenic system the difference between semi cryogenic and the cryo cryogenic uses liquid oxygen liquid hydrogen so there is a little difference in the difficulty in handling because 20 degree uh, ox uh, liquid oxygen is 20 degrees liquid nitrogen is something like 60 degrees kelvin uh, whereas here you can use uh, uh, kerosene and liquid oxygen so it becomes very benign as a fuel and much easier to handle so and it also gives you a little better thrust so this will be the next version and lastly of course advancement to that access of state is going to be using reusable recoverable system you would maybe reading beyond much uh, ideas of how we how we brings it back and uh, how it can be reused and over course once you use and reuse it then the cost of transportation comes down and the whole idea is from a percent cost which is something like $20000 per kilogram to be put for the geosynchronous orbit uh, we have to bring it down if it is going to be affordable to many other nations and many other groups we have to bring it down to something like $2000 to $5000 per kilogram so there are many things which are that in air breathing engines uh, the recoverable system reusable system these are also so many of these things are under early stages of testing uh, within isro isro i go next to the, the human flight because now we have been talking with a lot of caution in the past in this kind of lectures but this time having the prime minister already ordered us to write a work on the human space flight and he has also told that 75th birthday from the 75th freedom day of india we should have this up the indians will be circling the earth uh, three of them of course that is also there and he has also not characterized whether it should be man or a woman he said it could be either of them so he has put quite a lot of conditions too so we are working on that and there's a great challenge uh, something i think it, it, the initial versions will have a 40 400 km kind of an altitude and uh, it will take about 16 minutes to reach that particular altitude so three people are off from the ground in 16 minutes they are there and uh, of course a fairly large uh, uh, area 3.7 meters to 7 meters and uh, you need to select them so there's going to be a major thing so there are dozens of uh, aspiring astronauts uh, men and women uh, trying to buy with each other to go to the space and come back and uh, there are many critical technologies that on which a lot of experiments have been carried out things like reentry system crew escape system uh, thermal protection system life support systems and uh, space suit and things of that kind so there are many such things are that is going to be there but uh, many areas there have been already initial tests 
and uh, also ISRO will certainly work with other countries which are willing to come forward and it has been so in the earlier programs also with the idea that ultimately we will be a part of a larger space community working together on a global basis. So if they want to make sure that India is a part of it and they always find India to be a very good partner. The, most of the countries irrespective of politics, they find us to be an excellent partner because our engineers are easy to work with and uh, very and extremely good in analysis of various issues which they probably sometimes take much more number of people and even then they don't come with the final solution. In fact, uh, the Israelis once uh, told us that you go, your engineers guys simply take a back of the envelope and do some calculation and put the satellite. 104 satellites goes in all the direction as you want it. We are not able to think about that kind of a thing. So that, you know the kind of uh, feeling they have about India's space engineers and scientists is remarkable. It has to be felt when other countries look at you and they tell you. I just thought I should say that. So the partnership for this human space flight uh, certainly will be there. There will be a lot of offers. It's up to us to decide what is the strategy that we want to adopt. And then, of course, I go to the last of the thing. So where is it going to be? There was some discussion on 50 years later, how would, how, how would the space will fare as a global activity? So one of the things that will happen is, of course, the, the, we need to create a blueprint for managing the planet. That blueprint should have all the elements of the complex behavior of this planet, whether it is physical, chemical, biological, and so on. So how do you create that? You need a lot of data, a lot of observation, a lot of data, a lot of information. So this is, has to be global, regional, local, and in situ. So that is the kind of level set which it has to be there. So we need to create this. We put them into various types of models. So you go into a predictive mode using this kind of information. So integrated modeling approach. And ultimately, what you get as an outcome of this particular model, you try to de disseminate it to the stakeholders who would like to use it for their own end purposes. So that's going to be the way in which the system will move. And it will be a global system. India will be an important player in this global system. And so we put it down. This was a presentation that was made in Paris when four of the major uh, international institutions came together. So we said that the vantage point of space will assume greater significance to understand planet Earth as a total system and thus enable better management of the unprecedented scale of changes induced by anthropogenic activities and it's so on, it goes. So lastly, I would like to just to show that a space dimension is a dimension which is very difficult to recreate in other dimensions of human activity. Here is a picture of a city. I just take the next one. That city merges into a settlement. So you can see a satellite view of the settlement. I go further. I, that settlement is part of a continent, which could be India. So you see, already you have disappeared the whether it is a Karnataka Congress government versus Madhya Pradesh. It's all slowly just merged into this kind of a stuff. So you see it India as India. Go to the next one. I, I go a little further with a, my spacecraft and start taking the picture of the Earth. You will see India is a part of a subcontinent, part of a continent. So you can see India is there, but this is a part of a continent. This is a picture which has been taken uh, from a geosynchronous altitude. I go further, I use my lunar mission and take the picture of the Earth from Moon. So how does it look? You cannot see Kakodgar's institutions with uh, space institutions here. It is all part of a global activity here. So it's the Earth from the Moon. So you really start, what are we trying to do is to slowly merge features. And therefore, I hope the way the humans look at those features and try to create artificial barriers, they will go. And so then if you go further down, I go to Earth, I go to Mars and look at the Earth from the Mars. You can see the Earth is just a point uh, there. Uh, I hope you are able to see the... The Earth is there, you can, you can see that, right? This one. So that is the Earth. Uh, from the Mars. And finally, the Earth from Saturn, you can see. And there it goes. And then when we get, leave the solar system, your imagination is the best. Thank you.
Yeah. You can take a few questions. It was a really amazing lecture. I think wonderful to hear this about space for the first time. I think in this auditorium. Yeah. My question is related to the predictions uh, about the Earth behavior and what we were talking about, the two, 2050 mission. So the recent example about the Kerala flood, do we able to predict all such kind of uh, behavior of Earth? Yes. I think this, this, this is a question of, uh, you know, the, 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 the one is the climate part of it and the other is the weather part of it. When this particular event uh, took place, uh, there has been certain level of predictions yes. which was there. But I think we are not got accustomed to this kind of a, a severe uh, weather conditions. So to factor that into the daily activities was not something which was easy. That is number one. The second is when you have this kind of an event which is deluge, it is not just a flooding, deluge. The present system of configuring earth and the active human activities on the earth is done with certain numbers uh, as the limits. And if those limits are exceeded, you should go into the next one. If, it is, if, it, if you look at the Middle East, they have a certain way of dealing with the heat or hot weather. You come to India, you have another type of way to deal with the uh, weather. If you go to another place, a place like, uh, uh, say, central portion of an Australia, so already the humans adopt themselves depending on how the local systems are. And now if these kind of things are becoming more and more severe, so you need to have anthropogenic adoption. Everything cannot be done from the top, but certainly the top information which is in terms of uh, the parameters, the parameters going into a modeling, that will be strengthened, it will be more strengthened in terms of the ability to predict. But I think it is a combination of that along with the, what you try to do as an anthropological preemptive actions that will find a solution. But uh, certainly, uh, this is an area which is right now grey. So I cannot say we have all the knowledge about a severe weather system and how to deal with a severe weather system prediction even. And another question with your kind permission. Uh, you made us feel proud to be Indian after listening to you about our uh, achievements in space and all these things. Regarding the self-reliance of uh, our space programs and all, how deeply that got affected when America put sanctions on us? Uh, I should say that we have more friends than America. That is all it showed. So we could solve it. Uh, yes. So, uh, I mean, we always often, you know, very commendably talk about uh, the high achieving science that comes out of, uh, you know, the space research in India. So we have uh, scientists there, we have uh, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians all working together. So my question is about where do they come from? I mean, do they come from, of course, obviously from India, but from what is the kind of profile that they have? Do they come from IITs uh, or do they come from abroad? Or where are these, you know, high achieving problem solvers actually coming from? Because it's a very interesting good, question for good us. Good engineers understand. from common uh, colleges. That's very interesting to know. In yes. fact, so you can ask uh, my friend Kokorka how absolutely. he feels about. He has said, let a bigger organization of atomic energy. So I so can say from ISRO's experience. Precisely. Uh, or uh, the, 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 I can give you one example. The difference between a, a, a reasonably good college with an intelligent fellow who can be made out in an interview with respect to somebody who is high bro and gone from some of those IB schools is the fact that there could be a one or one and a half years of gap which you can make it up in the within the system itself Absolutely. and they are as good as anybody else. Absolutely. This happened in specific experiments we have done on mm -hmm. this and we are very clear that uh, there is not, of course there are other end of the thing which we should be avoiding but there is a substantial number which is available in this country from regular educational systems, I don't say bad education, the regular education system, who qualify themselves and perform eminently. Yeah, that could be wonderful there's, example is, for is, there's no science education on. policy also, yes. you know, yes. because yes. 
we are diverting all our energies towards uh, a, a target which is not really contributing to our own development. But many things we need to do in education. We will see that as and when we are able to speak about it. But I can say that uh, there are special, many things which we need to do all further. That is, uh, I don't say that it's not possible. That will enable us to move the islands of excellence into continental proportions, if you ask me that way. Sir, uh, how do you look at the private, private space sector in India? And do you think that we will have something like uh, common like SpaceX factor coming in India? And what are the opportunities for CubeSat programs for students in India? Uh, you know, private uh, uh, actors in space today are ones who are primarily contractors to ISRO, which is you get good money, but less risk because the risk is with ISRO and not with you. So that is a very, this is in the comfort zone, the uh, pri private uh, road. What we are trying to do is to make them do a systemic approach. If you have got a complete technology of PSLV, there is no reason why a half a dozen of the conglomerate of, they come together uh, and even the 500 of those industries which I said, they can come together and build that instrument. And ISRO will give them quality assurance and many other kinds of support, provide their, our facilities like the launch pad, they don't want to create a separate launch pad, it's be there. So there can be legal and uh, policy structures which will enable them to make use of government and public investments, but they will be on their own, they can build it, they can market it, and they can make money out of it, and there can be some agreement with respect to governmental part of their role that they can play. This is a realistic thing, this is already working, and ISRO, I, I understand, is already in serious negotiation on this aspect of it. The third, the second part of it is with respect to things like, uh, you see, most of the initial part of a research and development, which includes uh, things like a recoverable system, uh, things like what Elon Musk does, and so on, I think they are high risk areas. So public, it will have to come from public funding, take it up to a particular point of demonstration, and then work together with the industry to take it to the next step. And once it becomes an operational capability, put it to the industry to do that. So that is another model which we should have. On the CubeSat and other things, it is a question of stakeholders. If there are stakeholders, CubeSat is not a big deal as far as the technology is concerned. So if there are enough stakeholders, we build it. If there is no stakeholders, we will not be able to build it. This is they totally left to the uh, system uh, for the country to decide which areas uh, of this type uh, will be pursued. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Uh, I have a question regarding how, what are ISRO's plans regarding the decommissioned satellites which are in the orbit and how do the nations decide where they will put their satellites around the earth? See, yes, this is a very good point with respect to what do you use, do with the respect to a, 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 a satellite which has come outlived its uh, life. And there are, uh, uh, life is two definitions. One is an orbital life. Orbital life comes into fact because of the fact that as it revolves around the earth, the slowly the atmosphere, whatever residual atmosphere is there, it keeps dragging it down. Momentum reduces. When the momentum reduces, it further comes down and so on. So finally, it will spiral into the atmosphere and ultimately burn. So this is one way in which the orbital life is taken. On the other side is the one where there, are, there is fuel on board. Once the fuel is exhausted, then you will not be able to control the orientation of the satellite or orbital adjustments that you need to do. So in those cases, they can become a dead mass at that particular altitude because you are not able to control it. There are two ways to deal with this. One is, there are technologies that are being now discussed with respect to how do you refuel the system. So that is a, still a, a things which, are, which has not come to an operational capability. The other part of it is, three, you can measure reasonably precisely the amount of fuel that is left. Because there are sensors with which you can do that. Once you do that, you know within the next three months it's going to run out of the fuel. So what you do is, you use the remaining fuel, you have to calculate how much fuel you need and uh, kick it up or kick it down from the orbit which is the most favored orbit. In the, in the case of geosynchronous orbit, it is the 36,000. So you, I would like to bring it down to say 20,000 kilometers or 20, 25,000 kilometers so that it is no longer going to be a hindrance for the orbital 
requirements of the communication satellite. So that is the other part of it. So that is a, the third thing is with respect to the orbiting uh, system. Orbiting systems at 800, 900 is still a problem. Uh, they are trying to see whether it is possible to uh, capture them or uh, try to uh, uh, use a laser to split it into things. There are many experiments that are going on or even to do what you call as a, you use a big net in which you virtually tra trap them and bring it down. There are things that are of that kind that are being thought about. But they are all in the initial stages of thinking and concepts and uh, not an operational system. But this is definite. You can use the last ounce of fuel. The problem with uh, people is when the owners of the satellite, they have to forego three months of fuel. A typical communication satellite transponder uh, is in the market at two to three million dollars per year. And uh, a three, suppose I reduce the life of the satellite by six months uh, by this activity. Then uh, at three million dollars per transponder, and there are 24, suppose I take a very conservative figure of 24 transponder, 72, uh, 24 transponders into uh, with the three is 72. But half of the 30, so 36 million dollar, uh, dollar equivalent of revenue you have to forego just to save that particular orbit. So these are questions, there has to be policy and there has to be law which enables you to do this, that's it. Sir, I have one more question. Uh, why can't India join International Space Station? Won't it be more viable than, uh, in than starting a, our own uh, space uh, mission shuttles like that? Yes, if you have to qualify yourself for anything in this world, first you have to have the credentials, right? What is the credential for joining the International Space Station in your view? We should have our own. Uh, okay. uh, you answered? Okay. So good evening. So one is my, my uh, because uh, as we know, we are very confident that our engineers and scientists will take care of our satellites and other things. But uh, my question is about education because you are a member, of, uh, chairman for the policy commission, uh, education policy committee. So uh, as we I saw in Mumbai, uh, schools are run by municipal corporation. I am studied in government of in Karnataka run schools. So I feel I there is I observe some difference between the government runs. Government Department of Education the run schools and the municipal corporation schools. So municipals normally to cl just clean the drains and clean the city, maintain the city clean. So corporations running the schools is uh, not a good idea. So in your policy, I request you that uh, make it clear that uh, the schools education should belong to be the, should be the business of the government state governments rather the municipal corporations. So corporations can work only to eradicate uh, polio and uh, mosquito and other things, the rats, they let them do that business only, not to venture into the education. So that we can get a um, uh, very good, impart a good education to the school, uh, skills and other, uh, that level. And also one more is the, my, one of my friend uh, working as a scientist in NAL, Bangalore, he left for the private business, private uh, com com company job. And uh, now he is actually uh, repenting. Oh, I should have continued working with the uh, like a national building. So this is the, how we can we can uh, uh, avoid drain drain. Uh, you know, so people are living uh, in any like conditions. So like when maybe I don't know, there are when people who are joined airlines, uh, leaving the uh, government of organizations. So how can we gain back train train gain? So Modi government also organized working on the train gain. But how we can again we can uh, uh, achieve that uh, we can uh, best we can attract the best minds towards the scientific and achievements and other things in the, through your education policy. Education policy for schools we have identified a broader picture of how it will be regulated, how it will be funded, <coughs> what kind of outcomes you need, how do you do a, a, a CT, you know the what is that called accreditation processes. This is very thoughtfully we have enunciated the principles behind this. And uh, it's not the question of it even between private and public. It is all will be put in the street. So far there is always this feeling that private is a better education. I would like to send it to my, my child to a private education. That is one aspect of it. The second is there are other schools like CBSC and other kinds of institutions. There are very good ones on the other side. 
So we are trying to bring, make sure that the state-run education institutions and other local level institutions are corrected to bring to the level in which the present better run schools are done, number one. And they, we are also looking at the question of complexes. It is not one institute. You know, the running this educational institution in this country at uh, individual levels in many locations, geographic locations, is not viable simply because of the fact that they won't fulfill all the requirements of a teaching because of the number of students and the number of teachers available and the economics. So can you create complex? There have been earlier discussions on the complexes. So if we try to bring in the concept of complexes, a governance system which addresses the question through the complexes and don't have any kind of a distinction between the different uh, private, public, and uh, municipal, and those kind of a thing. And we have differentiated what they represent, what we need to do for that. I think the point that you know, ultimately will be taken care of. But ultimately, on the ground, we have to implement it. But that at uh, that this particular stage, more important is that we clearly understand the issues and enunciate the approach that we and need to adopt. Being a librarian, uh, because all of many, many of our, we see that uh, NPE also and uh, other things on there, all our body like IACT and UGC, they are, um, uh, we are marking budgets for libraries. Even uh, this last few, uh, last four years also, we have seen that every year, five years, five years, five percent, five percent, and ten percent budget cut for the libraries. No, I, and, uh, I, I think, I uh, think because we, without libraries, yeah, uh, you cannot. Uh, we don't, don't. Yeah. Even this particular policy comes. Yes, sir. Let us not try to put the benchmark of the previous actions. <laughs> Otherwise, you will reach nowhere. Yeah, because you have a policy. You have certain commitments for that policy in terms of resources. Yes, sir. Whether it is human, whether it is finances, whether it is infrastructure and we have to have the best of the practices. They are all properly enunciated. If you start saying that my library, they cut 10%, cut 10%, and if I use that model and put on this policy, yeah. is doomed. <laughs> but, uh, uh, the other I, part of it I is, you said about what is the other, other point? About brain is? drain away from nation building. Uh, but you said project. NALE has gone, right? Yes, sir. From, from NALE went right? to uh, private, private Infosys. But what is, what is wrong? They are all national wealth. It doesn't. <laughs> I think we should not too much distinguish about this private, public, and Infosys is uh, not uh, national or not uh, private. Uh, no, uh, not public. Is for Bombardier, that's why. <laughs> no, no, no. I, th I think the best of the brains in India should work anywhere and contribute anywhere, yes, and the country will benefit. Country should benefit. Yes, that's and we have got enough people not to worry about <laughs> these kind of small yes, Thank examples. You. Thank you, Mr. Evening, sir. Uh, my question is about graphene. A couple of years back, graphene came out as a new uh, product to be used in the space for the uh, heating systems. Uh, it made a uh, very uh, sound, uh, sound in the space uh, industry. Then it just lost its uh, value. Like uh, we were promised uh, s s br uh, elevators to space or uh, better spacecraft that wouldn't heat off uh, on uh, re entering. But we haven't seen yet, the, we have yet to see the use of graphene in our. Uh, the spacecrafts. Why is uh, it taking so much time? I, first of all, I don't set the agenda for what material to be used for what purposes. So the question, if you want to ask me, no, the is what is the future of graphene? Yeah. If you really look at the graphene, it's a, it's a wonder material. Because in one layer of a ca 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 carbon, you produce a strength, which is incredible compared to the any other chemical. So obviously, if that is a property, I'm sure engineers will use it. If they are not used, there should be some other type of limitation they may be finding and they may be working on it. Uh, you know, the, the people who announce uh, positively and optimally, optima, great optimism about certain development, they don't take it to the logical end, you should understand. And what you are telling may be the first level announcements. But first level announcement is not the last word on the usage of that, unfortunately. So that is one thing you should be, you should be careful. And there are many such examples. Why only graphene? There are many examples in which a first level announcement has been made and it is going to be a wonder and it is be, it, this is going to solve this problem, this problem and this problem. But they have got other, uh, other alternatives at that particular point. Economics, for example, if I ask you the counter question, what is the economics of using graphene for a certain type of application? Are you working out at any time? It's expensive. Ah, it's so expensive. It's, ah, that's the point. Thank you, sir. Good evening, sir. So it's regarding the, along with Keep the first it close question to he, has asked, he has asked for the delusion Kerala. And another one is with the uh, 
Yuki uh, cyclone in Tamil Nadu. What has happened to both the time? What is the Tamil Nadu? The cyclone was there. Ah. So these two things have happened even though the IRS was working. Right. The most of the TV uh, IMD people, what they were showing it on TV, they did not say anything about what is going to happen or what is predicted. They said heavy to very heavy rain is expected on both the side, both the time. This why I'm saying is this: we have the technology. The end user is not having any use of it. Many a times I have found, I am from Tamil Nadu, I keep watching the uh, channel regarding the fishermen. Every time you find the Tamil Nadu fishermen being cut by the Silonis. And they say they have been cut because they have crossed the uh, international border. Why this is happening? Why is it is not yeah, being I, I transferred to the lay layman? Yeah, it is. It yes. On one side, the the last mile communication. Even in the earlier times, we had found that there were problems of that kind of a thing. But they are singled out and uh, pointed out as one of the deficiency. I would also like to say that uh, there was a cyclone, for example, in Andhra Pradesh in 80s, where something like 100,000 people were affected, and then came this kind of very rigorous. Mama, so, so satellite data use, ground system use, and also modeling and simulation. And then in the next similar one, uh, nearly only 100 people were affected. So you can look at the numbers and clearly look at it. Don't take up one example of some fisherman not having got it. Yes, certainly it's quite possible. And you know, the, the, there is a scale in which the whole system has working today. That also need to be looked in. If, if you really look at some portions of it, they will solve the problem. When an entire state has gone under the water, then you need, you need a different ball game to deal with it. So I can't, I can't answer your question because I am not a part of that operational team that is going on there. But I can say, I can guess that uh, it needs to be studied in a much more uh, a way in which the scale up and the communication ease with which the thing gets into operational system is so on. You should also understand uh, the way if, if you, I mean, this is not a, I hope there is no press people here. You, you had also uh, problems in the United States in two or three states, you know, and the, they showed the floods yes. some years back. In what way, uh, uh, and they also put them in the camps, right? They had also to rebuild many things. In what way were they very different? They officially had everything uh, given in the last minute and so that everybody was happy? Mm. Did you? What no, why I am telling you, there are certain aspects of operational detail which need to be looked in. I am not telling that, but this is not specific to India. There are, this is a broader question to be seen. I don't know. An Anil, you have any view on this? No, I think the same thing, you look at it, supposing these facilities were not there. As we just said, an earlier cyclone, Hundred thousands or of that order, people uh, lost their life. The next cyclone, several orders of magnitude, uh, the, uh, the fatalities came down. Now, obviously, there may be an individual case where the service is not reached, and certainly we should work to improve Absolutely. our system to reach That's there. Right. But uh, things have improved. Uh, nobody can deny that things have not improved. Actually, I'm not talking about the things having improved or not improved. The thing is the, the transformation from the higher to the lower. See, look at the technology we have. We have the technology to go into the yeah, space. Yeah, but these so issues are not just technology. Yeah, it's much more. These are technology, technology management going up to the last man, including yes. governance system. So that will involve a debate which will cover, I think, uh, much wider range of expertise, which probably doesn't exist here. So okay. it's the totality that Im that's important. Can be. Sure. I think we take. Uh, yeah, one or you two please. More questions yeah. Here. Okay. Uh, good evening, sir. Sir, I want to uh, know what are some of the initiatives taken by ISRO for space pollution, uh, particularly for space pollution, considering uh, many of the satellites have been 
up there and many countries have raised their concerns about uh, not being uh, there there are not being enough initiatives by all countries for the space pollution you, see, you know the there is now a committee under the United Nations Committee for Outer Space, UN Corpus. And that is called as a committee to mitigate the disaster coming out of space pollution. And India is the chairman of that committee. Right now they are working out a strategy for the global community to uh, follow. And that will be finally discussed in the UN Corpus and it will be passed as a policy. And if necessary, it will go to the UN General Assembly and it will be passed as a thing which all the nations have to obey. So India is really the, the focus of preparing the necessary policy for it. What more can we expect out of India? I think we'll stop with that question. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, good evening. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to present the vote of thanks for this 17th VGK Memorial Talk. Firstly, I thank Dr. Kasturi Rangan for uh, a very insightful and detailed tracing of the history of the Indian Space Research Program and for the question answers, which were at times quite difficult. This talk had all the elements of an insider watching an institution grow, and that is where I bring it, uh, link it to Viji Kulkarni. This aspect of founding and nurturing an institution is what I remember of VGK. And as was mentioned earlier, he was the founder director and uh, was the chair for 20 long years. And it is his legacy and vision that we are all playing out even now. I thank all the previous center directors, especially Professor Arvind Kumar, who instituted this memorial talk. And uh, Professor H.C. Pradhan, who's there in the audience, and Professor Jayashree Ramdas, perhaps who's watching us on Facebook, and who was the first doctoral student of Professor V.G. Kulkarni. All of them, including Professor Subramaniam, the present center director, have always supported this VGK memorial talk. I am very grateful to Professor Sandeep Trivedi for uh, supporting this function and uh, Professor Dr. Anil Kakorkar for gracing this occasion. Next, I come to thanking the family of VG Kulkarni. I thank Mrs. Kulkarni, who has always been with us and I hope she continues to be with us for a very, very long time. I thank Anita, Vijike's daughter, and Raju, Vijike's son-in-law, and uh, Chandrasekhar Kulkarni and Kishore Kulkarni, who always have tried to participate in this, in this event. Coming to HBCSC, I will say that, like uh, Dr. Kasturi Rangan mentioned, any event or any, any uh, organization requires the help of various people. So I'm not going to name all of them, but I thank all the HBCSC, administrative, technical, scientific, and the faculty for their help in organizing this event. And lastly, this audience consists of a number of dignitaries. And I invite all of you to join us for tea. Thank you. <laughs>